Good morning and welcome to worship at First Presbyterian in Denison and Grand Avenue Presbyterian in Sherman. I also want to welcome those of you who are joining us remotely. We're glad to have you with us as we worship today. I would like to call your attention to the bulletin insert this morning. We are collecting school supplies um, for uh, one of the schools in Sherman and have a pretty extensive list. Uh, we want to be able to collect those and uh, and take those to uh, the school uh, by the end of September. And so we're uh, looking forward to uh, putting those together. And if you need more information about them, let us know. On September 24th, we will have a joint service here at Grand Avenue, uh, and that will be at 1030. So the last Sunday of September, we'll plan on a joint service with First Pres in Denison and uh, Grand Avenue, and that service will be here. Friends, the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Let us worship God. Please join me in the call to worship. God lifts us from death to life. And preserves us for God's purposes. Through the compassion of Jesus Christ our Lord. And the guidance of the Holy Spirit. With thanksgiving, praise the Lord. Let us confess our sins to the Lord of all, who was generous to all who call upon him. Please join me in our corporate prayer of confession. Lord Jesus, we call upon you. Save us. We are intimidated by our circumstances, distracted from your purposes, drowning in doubts and fears. We are presumptuous about your will, belittling others and magnifying ourselves. We envy the blessings of others, secretly despising their dreams. We have hardened our hearts to the suffering of our brothers and sisters, feeding ourselves in face of the injustice that holds them captive. Lord Jesus, who searches our hearts, lift us from sin and help us to walk with you in faith, humility, and brotherly, sisterly love. Amen. Join me in saying, in his name we pray. Amen. Our God sees all, knows all, forgives all, restores all through our Lord Jesus Christ. No one who believes in him will be put to shame. 
For everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. The Hebrew lesson today is Genesis, the 37th chapter, verse 1 through 4 and verses 12 through 28. Jacob settled in the land where his father had lived as an alien, the land of Canaan. This is the story of the family of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was shepherding the flock with his brothers. He was a helper to the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other of his children because he was the son of his old age, and he had made him a long robe with sleeves. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Now his brothers went to pasture their father's flock near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers pasturing the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. He answered, Here I am. So he said to him, Go now, see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock, and bring back word to me. So he sent him from the valley of, he valley of Hebron. He came to Shechem, and a man found him wandering in the field. The man asked him, What are you seeking? I am seeking my brothers, he said. Tell me, please, where are they pasturing the flock? The man said, They have gone away, for I heard them say, let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. They saw him from a distance, and before he came to them, they conspired to kill him. They said to one another, Here comes this streamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we shall say that a wild animal has devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. But when Reuben heard it, he delivered him out of their hands, saying, Let us not take his life. Reuben said to them, Shed no blood, throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but lay no hand on him, that he might rescue him out of their hand and restore him to their father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the long robe with sleeves that he wore, and they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. Then they sat down to eat, and looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels, carrying gum, balm, and resin on their way to carry it down to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, What profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers agreed. When some midnight traders passed by, they drew Joseph up, lifted him out of the pit, and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver, and they took Joseph to Egypt. Hear this word as it comes to us from Matthew 14, verses 22 to 33. Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately, Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. 
Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. We come to this story that we hear this morning, and it is, of course, a continuation of the stories that we've been hearing about people coming to Jesus, wanting to be healed. They come with ailments, they come with needs, and Jesus meets those needs. Part of what has happened, though, is just as Jesus has been doing this, he's received word that John has been killed. Jesus, at first, wanted to get away to a place by himself where he could pray. He got into a boat and tried to leave. The crowds came there, got there before him. They still had their needs. Maybe part of it is that they were wanting to see how it was he responded to this news. They heard it too. Jesus had compassion on them. He cared for them. He continued to heal them of their ailments, to cure their diseases, to treat them with great compassion. Think the things that he was doing were all things that would show something about who he was. Curing those who were sick, taking care of ailments, helping people walk again or see again or hear again, those were all signs of who he was, signs of his divinity, signs of him being the Son of God. They wanted to know about those things. They wanted those things done for them, but Jesus is trying to do some things to also be sure they know who he is. And at the same time, he continues to grieve for John, and I expect to be troubled by this news. The end of the day comes, the people are hungry, the disciples pointed out to him and that the people should go elsewhere to get something to eat. Jesus tells them that they should feed them, and they're shocked at this command. When they show him what little they have, he takes what they have, he lifts it up, he blesses it, he breaks it, and he gives it to them, and all of the people 
their thousands of them have enough to eat. Another sign of who he is. They all have enough to eat when they come together and offer what they have, express their gratitude. Everyone is blessed with his presence. The end of the day has come. He sends the crowds away. He sends the disciples to go get in a boat and go a different direction themselves so that finally he may have some time to himself. In some ways, maybe it's a little like being a parent when your kids are small. It's like it takes a miracle to be able to have time to yourself. Jesus had to perform a miracle before he could finally have some time to go away and pray. Maybe to grieve for John. Maybe to evaluate what was ahead for himself. Maybe to consider whether he wanted to go through with doing it this way, knowing that this very likely could lead to his own death. The disciples go out into the boat. Jesus goes to pray. And as can happen on any large body of water, but especially so on the Sea of Galilee, on Lake Tiberias, a wind can come up over the Mediterranean, come up over the hills and down into uh, that valley that forms the lake. And it stirs up a storm. The waters become choppy. They're afraid the boat could possibly sink at any moment. They're not sure what to do. And then they see a figure walking out on the water toward them. An apparition of some kind, a, a ghost, they think. It makes them more afraid. Wouldn't it you? In the middle of the storm, you see somebody walking on the water toward you? It makes sense that they would have been scared. Then Jesus calls out to them. They hear his voice. He tells them who it is. He tells them that it is Jesus walking on the water. Maybe another sign of who he is, not just by name, but who he is in his identity as the Son of God. Then Peter says, Lord, if it's you, uh, tell me to come with you. And Jesus says, come. Peter steps out of the boat and begins walking on the water. But then with the wind blowing all around him, maybe with the water lapping at his feet, he gets scared. He starts to sink. He doesn't know what's going to happen. How has he gotten himself into this situation? He calls out to Jesus, Lord, save me. And Jesus says, oh, you have little faith. But he reaches out his hand and lifts Peter up. He saves him. When Jesus says, oh, you have little faith, I don't think he's criticizing Peter. It may be more of a descriptive thing that he's saying to Peter, recognizing that all of them maybe have a little shaky faith in the face of all of this turbulence. There are other things happening here too. Matthew is telling us this story some 50 or 60 years after Jesus' death and resurrection. Matthew's church, the community of faith that he is leading, is facing turbulence. They're in the midst of storms. Lots of things have happened in those 50 or 60 years. There was a Jewish uprising, an insurrection. It lasted for four years as they were trying to push the Romans out. The Romans came back even more harshly. They not only defeated the Jews, but they destroyed the temple in the year 70. All the signs of everything that was important to them were gone. The temple was destroyed. The one that had been rebuilt, that Herod the Great had worked on for maybe some 50 years. A 
a beautiful, elaborate temple where they were able to come and worship and sacrifice and know that their sins were forgiven. It was all gone. So the larger Jewish community not only felt defeated, but they were without many of the things that were important to them as people of God. Then here's Matthew's community who not only knows the destruction of the temple, but they've been kicked out of the synagogues themselves because they follow this person, Jesus. They're not welcome. Families have split apart over these issues of who's in and who's out and who you're following and who you would know as the Messiah. It was a turbulent, stormy time for them. Maybe part of what Matthew is doing in recounting this story of the disciples being out in that little boat and facing that storm is to try to give courage to his community of faith that they might have faith, that they might have courage, that they might be bolstered as they face these turbulent times. Matthew is recounting this story, telling this story with some purpose so that maybe the people who are a part of Matthew's community would know a little more about what they are to do when they don't have the physical presence of Jesus with them. It's a message, really, for the church from that point on time, in time forward. The church had not had the physical presence of Jesus since his ascension. The church had the spiritual presence of Jesus. The church had the presence of the Spirit, the presence of God Almighty, but, but not the incarnated presence not the physical presence of Jesus. What do you do when you don't have that sense of presence with you? It's what the disciples were facing when they were facing that turbulence. Jesus was not with them. The storm was coming at them. They, they didn't know which direction to go. The wind was against them. It was maybe blowing them further out into the middle of the lake when they saw a presence coming toward them. Peter called out to him. Jesus said, come. When he began to sink, Jesus said, oh, you of little faith. But he wasn't saying it to say, Peter, how can I believe in you if you have little faith? He reached out and saved him instead. Does it seem like sometimes we face times when we don't have much faith, when we have our doubts, when we wonder how we can go forward? What do we do when we don't have the physical presence of Jesus with us? What do we do when it feels like we're alone in the world, we're doing all of this on our own as turbulence keeps coming our way? It's been reported lots of times over the past few years that the nuns are now the majority in the United States. The nuns not being the Roman Catholic women who wear habits, but the people who identify themselves as having no religious preference, uh, no religious connection. They are in the category of none. They are not involved in any of those things those can present us with turbulent times as the church. And here we are in the midst of turbulent times as a culture as well, when there are all kinds of things that feel like they're coming at us, winds blowing in different directions, choppy waters that we're in the midst of. What do we do? Lord, it'd be nice if we knew your presence was with us. But it feels like we might sink. Jesus takes the opportunity to identify that Peter maybe has some doubts or little faith, but he lifts him up. He doesn't push him down. He lifts him up and encourages him. He 
he saves Peter. He lifts him up, and they both get into the boat, and both getting into the boat, the winds cease. The storm is past. We might call out to Jesus, even in times when we don't necessarily think we have much faith. Jesus doesn't criticize us for having those doubts or those uncertainties. He reaches out to us as we call to him and lifts us up so that we maybe might be able to get back into the boat to feel as though we're safe once again. You might remember that many churches, including our sanctuary, is built to look like a ship or a boat that is inverted. In fact, if you look at some of the stained glass windows, you'll, you'll see a boat on the water. It's not just a reminder of this story, but for us to recognize that the church is thought of sometimes as a boat or a ship sailing on the chaotic waters of the world, like this inverted architecture of a ship sailing through the waters of life. Jesus encourages us that our faith might be built up. He doesn't discourage us because we maybe sometimes wonder or have doubts. Just call out. Jesus reaches out to lift us up. The story that we hear from Genesis is a, a great story of, um, of Jacob where the youngest son is one who is a dreamer. He dreams all kinds of dreams. He's a, he's a seer. He's, he's the youngest, and you might say he's a little spoiled. He's not just dad's favorite, but he's really gotten his way all through life. And he's been given the best gifts. He's been given all kinds of extra attention, and the rest of the brothers are not just jealous, they're hostile. When they get the chance, when their 17-year-old brother comes looking for them, they decide, oh, after the dream that he told them about, they've got some plans for him. The dream that he had was that he was the one who was asserting himself over all of his other brothers. All of his other brothers were having to be obedient to him, the youngest, the one who's already been spoiled by dad, the one who got the favored coat, the one who gets all of the attention. You have a dream like that and you tell somebody about it? What do you think they wanted to do? They wanted to skin him alive. They were ready to kill him. Literally. So they come up with a plan. They're going to do it. But they decide instead they'll just throw him down a dry well. They're going to leave him there until Reuben suggests to them that well, this traveling caravan that's coming by, you know, maybe we could just sell him into slavery and we'd have a little pocket change for ourselves. They decide maybe that's a better idea. And so they do. He's lifted up out of the well, sold to the traveling caravan, and he's off to Egypt. It's interesting that the voice shifts in, in this part of the story. We hear his voice as he's looking for his brothers, but after the conversation shifts to the brothers' plans, we don't hear from him anymore. We don't know his reaction to being thrown down the dry well. We don't know his reaction to being lifted back up out of the well and then sold to a traveling caravan. We just hear the details from the brother's point of view. Barbara Brown Taylor has an interesting story. Taylor was on vacation once on one of the barrier islands, and she was there at the time when the sea turtles were coming in to lay their eggs. And uh, 
to, uh, to make nests so that they would be able to, to uh, leave their eggs there. She was really impressed by this because she knew the story of these turtles where the turtles go for thousands of miles, years at a time, and then after feeding in different parts of the ocean, they come back to the very same beach where they had hatched and made their way into the water. They come back to that very same beach. They, they make their way up toward the dunes. They will dig their nest, lay their eggs, and then they will turn and go back into the water, leaving their eggs to hatch later on their own. Taylor was really fascinated by this and loved watching these turtles come in and dig their nests and lay their eggs and go back into the water. So she had gotten up early the next morning to see what she could see. She had uh, gone on a walk and had remembered where she'd seen one of the turtles come in. She went looking for the nest and when she found the nest that this turtle had dug, she noticed that the prints from her flippers didn't go back toward the water, but back into the dunes. The turtle had gotten disoriented and she'd gone the wrong way. And so she was alarmed. She knew if the sun got to be really hot that the turtle would not stand a chance. She would die back in the sand dunes and never be able to make it back to the salt water. So she called a ranger. He got there a few minutes later, took his Jeep, he went back into the dunes and found where the, the turtle was. He backed his, his jeep up to her. He went over, he took the turtle and flipped her over onto her back. Then he took out a log chain. And with the log chain, he put the chain under her front legs and then hitched it to the jeep. And then got into the jeep and took off. The turtle was startled by this. She, she stretched her neck out, and as the ranger was driving through the dune and down toward the beach, the turtle got her head caught on something, and her head was pulled back so that it was trapped underneath the top of her shell. So she was being dragged along through the sand, through the dunes, and then to the beach, Taylor was calling after the ranger, but he was not able to hear her. She went running as fast as she could. She finally was able to catch up when the ranger stopped at the edge of the water, got out. He took the chains off, saw that there was lots of blood. He took the turtle and flipped her back over onto her flippers, and it looked like maybe she was dead. She was not moving. He went and got a bucket from the Jeep. He went over and dipped it into the water. He brought it over and poured it on the turtle. She began to move just slightly. He got more water and, and poured it on her. And with each bucket of water, she seemed to, to be revived. Eventually, she was able to begin to move on her own as she made her way into the water that lapped up against her. She made her way through the surf and then back into the ocean. Taylor says, sometimes when you face a crisis, when there's turbulence all around you, you don't know what it is that's happening. You may not know whether you're being killed or you're being saved. You may not know whether you're being killed or you're being saved. For Peter, for the disciples, they were afraid, not sure what was happening to them or what the result would be. Jesus reached out to them and saved them turbulence came to an end. Jacob was not sure what would happen to him, but eventually that dream did come to fruition. In the end, 
he ended up saving his brothers and his family when the famine struck. We call out to Jesus. He responds to us to have us know that he is present with us. As we step into the boat together, maybe some of that turbulence begins to cease. We recognize the ways in which it's not a bad thing sometimes to have doubts or to not feel certain. But the presence of Jesus' Spirit is with us, saving us, bringing us together, sending us out into the world to face the chaotic, war the, the chaotic waters that we would know this is for us to do, to go into the world, to offer a hand, to reach out to those who are in need. Let us stand and say together what we believe. We trust in Jesus Christ, fully human, fully God. Jesus proclaimed the reign of God, preaching good news to the poor and release to the captives, teaching by word and deed, blessing the children, healing the sick, and binding up the brokenhearted, eating with outcasts, forgiving sinners, and calling all to repent and believe the gospel. Unjustly condemned for blasphemy and sedition, Jesus was crucified, suffering the depths of human pain, giving his life for the sins of the world. God raised Jesus from the dead, vindicating his sinless life, breaking the power of sin and evil, delivering us from death to life eternal. Friends, let us join together in a word of prayer for those persons in our concerns. Let us pray. God, we come to you in thanksgiving for all of the ways that you call to us as we face turbulent times. We recall the ways in which you encourage us, the ways in which you fill us with faith. We come before you remembering Milton, as he faces a small setback, we pray that he would be encouraged by Dee and by his daughters and sons-in-law. We pray that he would be encouraged by all of those who care for him, especially those through the church. We pray that he might find strength as we express our gratitude and our hope for him. We come to you in thanks for the life of Pat Richards, for all the ways that she was good and kind and faithful, the ways that she could be so funny, the ways that she was so supportive of her grandchildren. We pray that your blessings would be with each of them, upholding them as they grieve their loss. We turn to you in prayer for the people of Maui as they face the devastation of fire, as many of the things that have been important to them have been turned to ash. We pray with them 
as they recognize the loss of so many lives and of so many more yet to be identified. We give thanks for the ways that you surround them with love. We pray for the ways that we may be a part of reaching out to them through the church and through the agencies of our governments, that we might be a part of helping to lift them up, to recognize the ways in which they may go from ashes to hope one day. We pray too for the people of Ukraine and Sudan, Niger and other places around the world that are so harshly divided by war. We pray that we may be a part of helping them make peace. We pray that we may be a part of helping them know what it is to be loved by you and to recognize one another as neighbors, as people who care for one another rather than those who would tear one another apart. We pray that your blessings would be at work in the world through us to help them move closer to peace and security and goodness. We pray all of these things in the name of your Son, our Lord. Amen. Friends, let us give to God the Lord's tithes and our offerings. seated. Friends, the Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. Lord our God, we come to you in thanksgiving for all the ways that you give us these opportunities to offer ourselves and our gifts to you. We pray that you would take us and use us in proclaiming your good news in every part of your creation. We pray these things in the name of your Son, our Lord, who taught us to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Friends, now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our maker, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. The Lord be with us. The Lord be with us all.